The recent Artemis mission that saw a NASA capsule orbit the moon was a huge step in preparation for an eventual visit to our nearest neighbor. How'd they do it? Oh man, you know, it, 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 miraculously, that, that all my career from a graduate student on, I've been hearing over and over again how we could not redo Apollo, right? The technology, the, 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 the knowledge is lost, but yet here we are doing it again. And we soon will see Americans on the surface of the moon again, and hopefully a permanent presence. I'm the kind of person that says, okay, we did that. Yeah. We already went to the moon. Why go back? Well, because, you know, why climb Mount Everest? You know, if you talk to it, I'm not gonna, you know, I, I like to be real, okay? If you talk to the average person that does what I do, they'll say something about how we're saving all humankind or, you know, it, 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 but, but really, I think it's a mixture of several things. Number one, there's the scientific research component. OK, but there's also the economic opportunity that comes from having bases off Earth so that we could potentially take advantage of the resources that exist in outer space, like comets. Our economy now depends heavily on electronics, which require these very rare metals, rare on the surface of Earth, but not rare in the core of Earth, which we don't have access to. But luckily, when other planets were forming early in our solar system, they differentiated just like the Earth did, and all the heavy stuff sank to the center, but then later they collided with something. And so now we have chunks of core stuff flying around out there, and we're calling it asteroids. And so there's one asteroid out there that is, you know, at, at a value of more than something like a quintillion dollars, right, that we could potentially mine. So there's a third reason, and this is one that people don't like to talk about, but I think that there are geopolitical uh, implications. And that was gonna be my next question. Yeah. Uh, are, we, are we on the dawn of a new race? a new space race, right? Yeah. Uh, if we get to the moon again, yeah. I assume we're gonna plant a flag That's right. and says, this planet or this body yes. belongs to America. Right, we can say what we want. <laughs> and I expect that the Chinese, maybe the Russians, mm -hmm. the French, mm -hmm. they would also like to get to the moon yeah. to plant their flag, mm -hmm. to say this mass, this body mm -hmm. belongs to our country. So are we on the dawn of that? I think we are. I think we're already there, in fact, right? Uh, you know, sub, excuse me, low Earth orbit, orbital parameter space is being grabbed. Um, and you could look at the same thing for the moon. So the question I have is, you know, the analogy I make, is it gonna be more like the North Pole or the South Pole? And here's what I mean. All of us nations that are competitors, we exist in harmony at the South Pole because there is no military or commercial advantage to be gained there that anyone sees. But you go to the North Pole, now that it has melted, those continental shelves have oil. So everybody's fighting over it. Right. So what is gonna be the case with the moon? What is it gonna be the case with orbit? What is gonna be the case with Mars? We don't know the answer yet, but the thing is is that we know the problem could potentially occur. So there's two things you wanna do. You wanna get your treaties done, right, to keep, keep the peace, but also, just in case, you wanna go and grab what you can grab <laughs> while the getting's good, right? And, and you know, that's the reality, you know, we, we you know, we have not reinvented human beings. We have not reinvented nations. We're still in a competitive world, right? We're still in a dangerous world. So, you know, it's like hope for the best, but plan for the worst is kind of the approach. See, you, this, is very, this is really interesting because the answer that I thought you would give, right? And, and, and you can help me on this, is that, well, you know, uh, we are depleting resources here on Earth. Uh, you know, we, we have global warming, we have all of these issues. We may want to depend on another one of these planets to sustain life. Yeah. And so getting there and putting the necessary infrastructure in place for future humans may make more sense. But you didn't go there at all. I didn't go there at all. That's that save humanity answer. And, and the reason why is, is that even if Earth got blasted with a meteor, or a comet like it did 66 million years ago, mm -hmm. Earth is still way more habitable in that state than the moon or Mars are now, 
right? So if you, if you talk to, to me, imagine Antarctica without water, without oxygen, and with nothing to eat. And uh, dust everywhere that destroys all your technology. That's what the moon and Mars are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, life can only exist in the protected nooks and crannies of uh, you know, certain places in the universe. And usually those places are under miles of ice, miles of rock, or miles of atmosphere, right? Earth is really lucky. We have this protective bubble of our magnetosphere, which is protected by the sun's magnetosphere, and most life is, has other layers of protection either under water or earth. The fact that we have surface life that exists under a transparent atmosphere is incredibly rare. We don't see liquids under thin, transparent atmospheres anywhere else. The only other body with abundant surface liquids is the moon Titan. And Titan has this, its, its atmosphere is more massive than the Earth's, even though it's much smaller, a much smaller body than the Earth. So if you lived on Titan, you would not even know that stars exist, because you wouldn't be able to see them through your super thick atmosphere, right? Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. So what do we know about the moon now that we didn't know before? Yeah, so the moon, we learned so much more and more and more about the moon. Uh, you know, the big surprise when the Apollo astronauts went up there and they got some moon rocks and brought them back to Earth, it was, oh my goodness, the moon is made of Earth, <laughs> right? But then we started studying the moon more, and we learned, you know, it's very different, the far side from the near side. And then people started thinking about fusion, and they thought, oh, maybe helium-3 is a better fuel to add to deuterium than tritium because it's less radioactive. Initially, you know, for billions of years, the sun has been depositing helium-3 in the lunar regolith. Maybe we could go to the moon and mine the helium-3. It's not clear that that is a solution, uh, but, you know, and now we also know there's water on the moon, right? So the key thing is our technology and our aspirations have come to a level where just as the United States have outposts around the world in places like Guam that makes it easier to get where you want to go, the moon can be that for Earth, right? The or, you know, or, orbit is one thing, and then having a solid base where the gravitational cost of getting off that body is far less, and if that body has its own fuel right there, then that can be very valuable for taking advantage of Going to Mars. the outer solar system. Exactly, and you know, I really think that uh, even though we may never colonize Mars, some people think we may, I think space tourism is a real thing that may happen. Some bazillionaire somewhere is going to want to go to Mars, and there'll be a That's someone who starts. will provide, and someone will provide a, I guess, a rocket ticket. That's right. That's Not right. a train or a bus ticket, yeah, yeah. but a rocket ticket in order. To that's right, yeah, that's right. But look at it though, right? If you look at the car, if you look at the airplane, initially it was only the gazillionaires who had access, right? But eventually now, even in our lifetime, remember like in the 70s and 80s, you know, if you, if you had a car, you know, there was, you know, 50-50 probability you even had air conditioning, <laughs> right? And now, you know, everybody has a car that is very safe, very efficient, has all the, the bells and whistles, right? And so I think that space access, because what's happening right now is we're building a new infrastructure for space access, right? It's not just at the national level, we now have it at the private level, right? And so things are changing rapidly. And so in the near future, I think that just like People can go, oh, I want to go see the Northern Lights, right? You just go up to the poles and do it. You can be like, yo, I want to take a trip around the moon, or I want to go to low Earth orbit, and it will be possible for, you know, upper middle class and middle class people. Understood. Outstanding. Yeah. So what new technologies, in your opinion, have to be developed in order to make this a reality? So they're already doing it, right? So uh, it all depends. If you look, I think one of the key elements is fuel. So the big problem that Artemis had is that it still uses liquid hydrogen as the fuel. Liquid hydrogen, think about that, okay? It has to be like negative 450 degrees Fahrenheit. It's so low density, so keeping it inside of a hose is very difficult. Think about it like this. If you look at the difference in density between lead and water, the difference in density between water and liquid hydrogen is even greater. Than lead. Than lead, comparing lead and water. Wow. 
Yeah, so that stuff is very, very difficult to work with, right? And so other missions use other types of fuels. Um, now, a lot of people have thought about a space elevator, right? You have a, a satellite in um, geo, geostationary orbit, right? But if you do the calculation of the altitude you have to go, if you move that 200 miles per hour, it still takes you a super long time to get up there. So there's a lot of practical things that you have to work out. But if you look at Artemis, right, they develop new systems um, and one of the most interesting is how they re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, all right? So you have this new capsule, this new heat shield, but again, instead of doing a direct re-entry, you do a skip re-entry, where you shed a little momentum and then go back, right? And now you can more accurately choose where you want to land, so that means that you don't have to cover an area of op ocean with ships, you now have a narrow region there, right? So we're getting better, we're getting more precise. It's like looking at war back in the day, right? Or looking at the Russians using artillery to just blanket an area versus Americans who's like, no, we're going to hit there. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. So what's next for the Artemis program? This is a phase deal, right? So, yeah. so what happens next? So the first thing we did is we sent a craft without humans, and there were a lot of sensors on board. And the thing that we're doing now, which, you know, why didn't we think of this before? The space environment and radiation affects females' bodies differently than it affects male bodies. So they put mannequins on there with sensors to figure out how the radiation environment is gonna affect females. But then now, we're gonna do the same thing with real humans next. And so I love the way that NASA says when the next step is gonna happen. They say, not before 2024. Not you know on this date in 2024, but not before a particular date. But after we do that, then we're gonna put, just like we have an International Space Station orbiting Earth, we're gonna have an orbiting space station orbiting the moon. And then we're gonna actually send humans to land on the surface of the moon and start taking care of business. And after that, hopefully it'll become routine, we'll build a moon base on the surface, and then after that, it can now serve as a staging area to go beyond. I would be remiss, right, because there's one other uh, reason, mm. in my opinion, for exploring other bodies in space. Mm. And that other reason comes to the age-old question, mm. is there life somewhere else? Right. I think probably, definitely. Be and, and, and I'll tell you why I say that. Is because when we find the first evidence of life on Earth, uh, conclusive evidence, it's already evolved life at 3.5 to 3.8 billion years ago. And you know, Earth has only been 4.5 billion years ago. So that tells me that if the conditions are right, i.e., there are liquids and you're shielded from radiation and in the right temperature zone and you have a, a energy gradient, a temperature gradient, life gets started quickly. But there's life and there's life. When we think of life, we think of us, right? We think of cows, you know, grazing in the pasture. <laughs> think about the fact that the life that came into existence on Earth, right? First thing is, although life today depends on sunlight and oxygen, when life got started, it was in the absence of sunlight and oxygen. It used chemosynthesis, right? The, the light would have broken up those molecules. And then that life, again, was on this transparent atmosphere world getting blasted by sunlight, and it still took up into two billion, it took two billion years for that life to figure out how to use that sunlight to break apart water molecules to create, create oxygen. And of course, that oxygen killed off all the life virtually, right? So it took another two billion years for life to adjust to that oxygen and now use it as fuel to make multicellular animals like ourselves, all right? So we've only been around for half a billion years, but then we only have a billion years left, right? The sun is getting a little bigger every day as it evolves. So in a billion years, our oceans are gonna boil away, life, multicellular life as we know it is not gonna be possible. So we have a 1.5 billion year window to do everything we're gonna do, and then we can leave Earth and save humanity. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Well, 1.5 billion years, that's not... Eh. It's not short. No, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's pretty long. Yeah. That's pretty long, too. I get, you know, it, it'll be the, what? The grand, 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 grand. Listen, I play a thousand a times game, right? grand, grand, right? <laughs> <laughs> amazing, amazing. Yeah. So, if the opportunity arose, mm -hmm. 
today. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, 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 you got a call from the president or someone yeah. that said, Hakeem, mm. we are looking for volunteers mm. to take that walk mm. on the moon. Yeah. We need people who are knowledgeable, who know what they're looking at. Yeah. And they said, we would like you to be one of the individuals. Yeah. Talk to me about what your, what, what your answer would be. First, my eyes say, are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, uh, absolutely I'd do it in a heartbeat. Now that one way trip to Mars, I don't know if I'd do that, <laughs> right? But going to the moon and coming back in a heartbeat. There's no question about it. I definitely would do it. But not the yeah. one way, but not the one way trip to Mars. Not the one way trip. It depends on my age. You know, if, if, if I have, you know, some terminal disease or something, I'm definitely down. I'm, I'm, I'm going for it. Right. And, you know, age is a terminal disease. Right. <laughs> so, you know, I'm getting close. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, I love experience. I love wonder. I've been to like over 40 countries on Earth. And every, t- every time it's new, and that's just one planet. Imagine going to a completely different world to explore and seeing things you've never, ever seen before, experienced before, and having the opportunity to contribute to humanity's advancement. No question. We have a number of our students in the audience. I'd like to open it up uh, for questions. So any questions you have uh, would be greatly appreciated. So how do you just forget how to go to the moon? That's what I'm kind of confused about. Yeah, that was a long time ago. And, you know, when you are, when you have a factory that builds things, <laughs> you know, it, it's outfitted to do that. And when you no longer have that purpose, you repurpose that factory, you tear everything down. And also, if you think about it, in my lifetime, how did we store digital data? It started off with those big, well, those big floppies, and it went to a smaller floppy, then a smaller floppy, then I had jazz drive and, all these other things, I can't use that now. I used to have an old box of uh, VHS tapes. What am I gonna play that in? I'm a member of the Screen Actors Guild, all right? So now it's time to vote for Oscar winners. They send me DVDs. How am I gonna watch those movies, (laughs) right? So, you know, things just get out of date. So keep that in mind as you develop new knowledge. How do you keep it, how do you preserve it? And how do you pass it on to the next generation? Well, we know our future is intact and we know we have another place uh, that we will all visit someday soon. Yes. So I want to thank you, thank you Dr. Olusehi, for spending time uh, with us. And, and I want to thank all of you for the next episode of Mason, Our Future Transformed.